How great is our God. How great is our God. Let me tell you one way how great our God is. As Pastor mentioned this morning, He saves us from the terrible wrath that is to come. People mock at this day, and churches don't preach the full revelation of the Word of God. And it's a very, very important point for us to understand that when Jesus Christ came to this world the first time, He came as a weak, need, wobbly lamb to save sinners. He will come back as a mighty judge, as a mighty warrior, and as a mighty king who will pour out His wrath on all those who are not found in Him. The message of reconciliation comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be reconciled to Him today if you do not know Him. He was made to be sin. For the, He who knew no sin became sin for us. And that is a blessing. And that's how great our God is. Amen. And that's what love really is. Though we deserve the wrath and penalty of God, He has made the way for us. He did what we could not do for ourselves. And that is the heart of the gospel. That's the heart of what God has done. That's how great He is, and that's how awesome His love is. And it doesn't fail. That cross is empty. He defeated our enemy, our final enemy, which is death. And He has come in the person of the Holy Spirit to indwell us and to change us into His image. He didn't come to fix you up. You and I are the problem. Our sin nature is the problem. He came to break our will in that way and by the power of the Holy Spirit to create the nature and the character of Jesus Christ in us that we would live like Him, for Him, and in every way about Him. So that's the great love of God and the great blessing we have. So, I said by way of encouragement, that is the gospel message, that there is reconciliation for sinners. So we praise His holy name for it. So, brothers and sisters, if you would, join your hearts in prayer with me to this great and awesome God. So, Father in heaven, we do stand in awe of your mercy and grace on us another week, Lord. Uh, Lord, we have stumbled before your mighty hand, behind, be, before your righteousness, Lord. We have broken and transgressed your ways this week. But Lord, because of your great love for us, Lord, you did what we could not do for ourselves. And Lord, you continually come to us, Lord, desirous that we would be changed to be more like you, Lord, that we ourselves, but the deposit of the Holy Spirit would be your hands and feet upon this land. Lord, we would, we would do your will by loving you, Lord Jesus, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. Lord, that's your plan. Now, we have our own plans, and we have stumbled and gone our own way. But Lord, because of your great love, you keep coming to us in that truth. You call us to lay down our temporal battles, Lord, to give up being captain of our own ship, Lord, and cause you to lead us to be the true captain, to treat, to be our true guide. And Lord, I pray that we would see that so much more clearly today because of your incredible, unchanging nature. Lord, we can have great peace and rest in you alone. Despite what this world looks like, Despite what's going on in our lives, despite our personal struggles and our trials, the cross has exposed us as guilty before you, Lord, but you have redeemed, Lord, you have saved, so our faith is in you and you alone. So, Lord Jesus, come upon us in power. Holy Spirit, stand up in us, Lord, that we may receive this amazing word, this amazing truth this day, that our pastor, by your Spirit in Him to bring this Word to us. And I pray that we would not leave these doors changed this day. So Lord, help us. Lord, we are needy, we are sinners, and we need You. Lord, do what we could not do for ourselves. Awaken us, change us to follow Your will and Your way. We praise You for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. So brothers, just one more, brothers and sisters, just one more encouragement. You know, we... Um, 
there is so much that goes on that we can't communicate to each other because we don't have our prayer request bulletins and um, just this COVID and all that goes on. But I do want to you to know that God is on the move powerfully in our church. Amen. Amen. I mean, there is, I, I can't even begin to tell you, and Pastor can tell you, I mean, it, it's, um, it's, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. There are so many people God has brought into our lives. Um, just so everyone knows that you'll be praying for it, Monday night we started a men's group in my house. We're running out of chairs already. Um, mm -hmm. People, amen. People driving an hour. People, um, you know, it just all. It, it's it's really truly amazing, and um, uh, be praying for that because there are people coming under conviction of the truth of the gospel, right? And we're, we're blessed that even Travis in our midst here, he's, he's you know, God sent him to us through safe families. God answered our prayers at church, and then God gave us that uh, the blessing of He and His children. So God's working in His life, in His heart. We praying. He's drawing near to the Lord. That's a struggle, right? We all remember when God saved us. We struggled with the flesh. We struggled reconciling the gospel in our heart. But He calls all of us to continue to lay down our lives before Him. So again, just. Be encouraged. There is amazing ministry going on. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a microwave in our front entrance here. We'll be helping a family from Waterbury. Um, and so many, so many other things. Just uh, praise be to the Lord Amen. for our opportunity to serve Him. Amen. So brothers and sisters, <laughs> if that's not enough, I have the amazing blessing to read you these 14 verses from Hebrews chapter 13. If you're familiar with the text, it's just watershed text. It, it, it is... It is very, very powerful. It speaks all these truths that we're, we're going, you know, that are all about the gospel, the blessing of who we are as a church, and uh, so many other things. So, uh, if you're able, uh, please stand for the reading of God's word. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some of you have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those who are in prison as if you were there together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated as if you yourself were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all. And the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of the way of their life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial food, which is of no benefit to those who do. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the whole most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the camp to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. 
For here we do not have an, endure, an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. May God bless the reading of his word to your soul. You may be seated. Amen. Um, again, a great passage of Scripture there uh, that our brother read. And um, we're going to be focusing, as I said, really on verse 8. Um, so the title of this is, What Can We Count On in the Midst of Unprecedented Change? That's a good title, I guess. I had, different, I had a bunch of other different titles. And, and I don't know what the title has to do with how many people watch it online or don't watch it online. It varies unless Brother John preaches, then it goes, you know, viral, goes, goes through the roof. <laughs> What's it say? What's that? It's the beer. <laughs> it's the beer. Um, so I try to have a little point there in the title, maybe to, to draw some attention, really. But for us, too, what can we count on in the midst of unprecedented change? We're living in a world of unprecedented change. We've always lived in a world of unprecedented change, but right now it uh, seems to be ratcheted up a little bit. The central idea is simply Jesus Christ is immutable. That's one of the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one of the attributes of God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. To know the Father is to know the Son. Amen. He's immutable. He's unchanging. Um, and we can't fight change, right? Some of us uh, enjoy change more than others. Some don't like it too much at all. But um, I guess I could say if we don't like change, good luck with that because <laughs> the world is changing. And we're changing. Um, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just from verse 8, he's our mediator. He's our intercessor. He's our high priest. That is all unchanging. And I have, a, I have an inclination maybe of preaching, Lord willing, on some of the other attributes of God and of uh, God over the next few weeks. I'm not sure, but we'll see. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That should mean something to us here this morning. So Lord Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for the steadfastness, for the truth of who you are, that you are immutable and you are unchanging. And because of that, all the other attributes of God hold fast because you are unchanging. You cannot change. You cannot get any better than you already are. Certainly, you're not going to get any... It's impossible for you to be anything other than what you are. So, Lord, help us to hear it. Help us to heed it. Help us to see through the power of your Spirit what it means for us this morning. That you are... How does it affect us? What difference does it make in our life that you are immutable and that you are unchanging. Help us to see it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So those three are just kind of blended here in that verse. He's our mediator. He's our intercessor. He's our high priest. Jesus Christ is the same. <laughs> okay. And the writer here of the book of Hebrews uses both names, Jesus and Christ. The name Jesus embraces the work in the word of God's Son on earth. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, the manifestation of Jesus on earth. You know that Jesus existed before the creation of the world. He and the Father existed before the creation of the world. There was never a time when they were not in existence. But that word uh, Jesus reminds us that he came to dwell amongst us. That's a huge glorious truth in and of itself as it relates to <clears throat> in the midst of everything that's changing around us. That he is our Emmanuel. God with us. He came to save his people from their sin as our mediator. The name Christ is the official title expresses the divinity of the Son of God. And the name, I, I never actually could figure this one out. When I was in seminary, graduating from seminary back in 1993, and I was talking to the, it was like a closing interview type of thing, exit something, you know, how do you, took the final exam and 
you talk to the guy who was the administrator of the school, and I don't know, he asked me a bunch of different questions, and, and one of them was something like this, well, sometimes I notice you say, you mention, you, you mention Jesus, you say Jesus, and you say something about Jesus, and sometimes you say Christ, and, you know, sometimes you use that name, sometimes you say God, he goes, well, how do you differentiate, I'm, I'm going, I, I don't, I'm not aware that I'm doing that, they're all one and the same, they're all one in being, one essence. I've been reminded lately of, uh, of a pastor in Meriden that I know, and every time he writes a letter to his congregation or to the school that my kids are going to, he signs the letter every single time. Except for one time, nothing's always, can't say every time, but I mean like 99% of the time he signs it, in Christ. I used to do that a lot. In Christ. That we're in Christ. That we belong to him. So I don't know, you know, why you say Jesus... They're one. The double name occurs only three times in Hebrews. Hebrews 10, 10, 13, 8, that we just read, and verse 21. Nothing to get hung up on at all. Jesus Christ is changeless. Jesus Christ, see, get hung up on some of those things are like non-essential things when there's just so many other things that we need to know and learn as children of God and, and go after and pursue those things and not get caught up in non-essential type things or uh, chasing rabbits, I call it. The Under Dictionary defines immutability as the divine attribute of unchangeableness. Okay, so God does not change. Change could be either for the better or for the worse, but are inconceivable with God. He couldn't get any better, he can't get any worse, there's nothing about him to change. Okay? And we can count on that immutability unchanging. You know, we change. Our response to people change. People's response to us change. You go to Jesus. It's un he's unchanging. God's immutability sets him apart. Everything else changes. The whole universe is changing. Galaxies die and begin. Even the sun is slowly burning out. Our world is constantly changing. And yeah, I, I guess I'd say I guess people that lived in other eras would say, oh man, this is the time of change. I've never seen anything like this before. Certainly we would say, well, we're in a time of change. We've never seen this stuff that's going on now before. Our world is constantly changing. Seasons change. We grow old and die from the beginning of life to the end of life. All we know is change. The book of Revelation gives a drastic picture of the stream changes that the heavens will undergo fire, uh, eventually dissolving them, and the stars will fall, and the sun will go out, and the moon, and the, but all those things, and the heavens will be rolled up like a scroll. But in the midst of that, right, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. He is our mediator. So let's talk about that for a minute, for a few minutes. What does it mean that he is our mediator? So there's several scriptures I wanted to read. I'm, I'm up here with three Bibles here again. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 18. But now in Christ Jesus, here he is our mediator, but now, actually, and, and when, when, when we say we're in Christ, Paul said that all the time. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Look at look what the benefits are. Look at the blessings of being in Christ. But now, in Christ Jesus... You all were far off, away from God, but now you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. This speaks of uh, the blessings that we have of being in Christ. I read a daily devotional, I think it might have been John Piper this past week, it was actually yesterday, and it said, all the benefits, all the blessings of being in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. He himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of dividing wall, Jew and Gentile, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And he might reconcile them into one body through the cross by having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who are near. So that's what the Lord Jesus Christ does. That's what God does. He preaches peace to those who are far away, those who are far off. 
and you, got, you have no idea, well, actually you do. Think about it. You think about it as a believer in Christ. Who witnessed to you? Who shared scripture with you? Who gave a Bible verse to you? Who said I was praying for you? Who tried to help you to see who God was? And who helped you to see that there's a Savior and He wants to save you from your sin? And how God used situations and circumstances in your life and in my life from the very beginning. I mean, I think back on my life as a teenager and um, the different things that God was showing me and the different things He helped me through and how God sent different people in our path. That's the beauty, that's the mercy, that's the love of God. He goes after those who are far away. He goes after those who are far off. You're not looking for Him. Initially, you're not looking for Him at all. He goes after His own. And that is something we ought to just be profoundly thankful and appreciate. Amen. For through Him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with saints in our of God's household. He's the mediator. He goes after his children. He seeks, he woos us with his irresistible grace and invincible love. There's divine sovereignty and there's human responsibility, yes. Those whom he calls, he saves. Amen. He does. Otherwise nobody Believe would be saved. Amen. Nobody. Amen. Hebrews 9, 15, because he's the mediator for this reason, He's the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may have received the promise of the eternal inheritance. Our mediator. He goes after us. Mediator of a new covenant. You know, the book of Hebrews, before COVID hit, I was going through a series with you all from the book of Hebrews all the different verses that spoke about Jesus, our faithful, forever high priest. And then COVID hit, and it was, other things needed to be spoken of at that time. Maybe we'll go back to that at some point. Our faithful, forever high priest, and what that means. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 10. Actually, Hebrews verse, chapter 5, verse 7 and 10. Verse 7 says, In the days of his flesh he offered up prayers, in supplication, with loud crying, in tears to the one who is able to save him from death. And he has heard because of his piety. Being designated by God in verse 10 as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. He is able to save. Jesus is able to save. Jesus is our mediator. Praise him. Thank him for it. We, he represents us before God. He goes after us. I love 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. In the one particular setting when I was in, back in the early 80s, and I was at a seminary in Hartford. I told you the story before, and the instructor goes, we're saved by God. And I said, he goes, and God wants everybody to be saved, therefore everybody's going to be saved. And, I, and he quoted, let me get there, 1 Timothy chapter 2. He quoted this, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And his argument there was, we're all saved, everybody's going to be saved, he wants everybody to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, and there's many different ways to God. No, there's only one mediator. And so I said to him, well, what about the next verse? For there is one God and one mediator, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, the proper, gave himself a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. One mediator between God and man. Praise him for that. Let's never lose sight of that. Let's never forget that. And as we're witnessing and as we're sharing the good news with people, like Brother John said, it, it is pretty exciting lately. It, it's like we can remember praying here we gather together usually right here at these steps and pray on a weekly basis unless something deters us. And there was times when we pray over the years that John's been here and over the years that I've been here. And it's like, God, what's, 
nothing's really happening. What's going on? What do you want? To, what are you doing? And, and of lately, it's just been like many, many opportunities that the Lord is giving us uh, to share the gospel, to share the good news, to minister to people. Um, and this is the message that we're sharing. There's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. There's salvation in no other name, granted under heaven, by which we may be saved, other than Jesus. So everything that we do as a church has that end focus. Okay, It's about Jesus. He's the mediator. Because He's the same yesterday, He is our mediator, and that's what we're saying here. So we need to bring people to Jesus. We're all under application here. We need to bring people to Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, those beautiful verses in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there it is again. Read, read the Bible in the New Testament in Paul's epistles. That's where you'll see it. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And the blessings and the, and the beauty and the, and the splendor of being in Christ. And it'll help you to be reminded of how you came to be in Christ in the first place. And it will help you just become profoundly fall deeper and deeper in love with your Lord and Savior, such so that it will affect your, our actions and our behavior. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled to himself, reconciled us to himself. I lost my place. Through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So that's what we have. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself as one mediator, not counting their trespasses against them, and he's committed to us all here the word of reconciliation. And we're ambassadors for Christ, verse 20 says. You know, ambassadors represent, bring people, represent people before a king. Amen. We're ambassadors for Christ. As though God, we're making our appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. That's the urgency of the day. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. He is our mediator. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's our intercessor. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, refers to that intercessory ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ that he performs in heaven where he represents the believer in God's presence. Awesome thought here from Hebrews chapter 4. I love quoting this verse. I quoted it to you before. I preached through it before. Hebrews 4, 14. Therefore, we have this great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. So let's hold fast our confession. That's how we know whether a person is the Lord's or not. That's how you know whether a person has been genuinely saved, whether they've raised their hand, come up before the congregation, are baptized, or whatever it is, if they're holding fast to their confession of faith, even after their baptismal, right? The book of Acts, after someone's born again, after someone's saved, one of the things that could happen early on in their life is being baptized, identifying themselves with Jesus Christ before the congregation and then before the church and then becoming a part of a local church body. Right? All the letters Paul wrote were written, well, the letters of the New Testament are written to churches. Identifiable groups of churches. And so that's what we're called always to do. All of us as children of God are called to be Identified with him through baptism, to be identified through him through a local church, a visible local church, not something just that's out there in existence. And I would say to you, it's biblical, I've said this before, it's biblical to be part of a local church. Therefore, it's in disobedience, I would argue, and my pastor friends would argue, it's unbiblical for a Christian not to be part of a local body of believers. Amen. Amen. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let's journey with confidence to the throne of grace, 
so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He is our intercessor. We go to Him right in prayer. We go to Him with our needs. We go to Him with our fears. We go to Him with our anxieties. We go to Him with our troubles. We go to Him with all of our stuff of life. Come boldly to the throne of grace that we may receive. And He intercedes for us. I, I, what does He pray? Ever think about that? What does He pray for you? When He's interceding before you, before the Father, I mean, it's all good. It's all good. I think of that verse where it says, Martha, Martha. Be like, John, John, you're so worried and troubled and perplexed over so many things. Only one thing is necessary. You know, seek me, sit at my feet. He intercedes for us. Certainly that we would look like him. And that's why, and that we would be one. You can actually look at the different verses in the Bible where Jesus is praying, John 17 in particular, for the disciples and for all future believers. Hebrews chapter 9, again, as this faithful, forever high priest, these verses in Hebrews are packed with this. Hebrews 9, verse 24, as intercessor, it says, For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And please always remember, God is for you. He's not against you. He is for you. Romans chapter 8, thinking about our intercessor. Romans chapter 8, 34 and following. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we are overwhelmingly conquered through him who loved us. I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principality, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Jesus is our intercessor. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because Jesus is the same yesterday and today, forever, by way of implication, we need to be more devoted to prayer. The Bible says, devote yourselves to prayer. Keeping alert in it. Devote yourself. Devote yourself to prayer. Keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Prayer. Being devoted to prayer. Luke chapter 22, verse 32. And you all know the greatest example we have of being devoted to prayer. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. Simon, that your faith may not fail, and that when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. When you turn back, strengthen your brothers. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Let's look at uh, this intercessory prayer and being devoted to prayer. I urge you then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Ephesians 1, 16. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, Paul says. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21, I will read it. It's a great prayer that Paul offered for the believers. Ephesians 6, verse 18. You're familiar with that verse. I know you are. It goes. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. And keep on praying for all the saints. Acts chapter 12, verse 15. Uh, verse 5, Acts 
Acts chapter 12, verse 5. I'll read verse 15 just for fun. You know, sometimes it's not such a good idea sometimes, you know, to just go, okay, God, you know, don't do this. Like, God, just speak to my heart and you, you, know, you close the Bible and you just, like, point to a verse and go, okay. Because I was going to read verse 15 and it said, um, you're out of your mind. It's not the verse that I wanted. I wanted <laughs> verse 5 that says this. Um, oh, I can't find it. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Hold on. So Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. So there's the plug for intercessory prayer, corporate prayer, the church praying. So, And we got Jesus' example for us to follow uh, as it relates to prayer. Alone in the morning, alone in solitude. Matthew 14, 23. Matthew 26, 36 in the garden. Going away to a solitary place. Mark 1, 35. He is our intercessor. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is our intercessor. He is our priest forever. Our faithful high priest forever. Hebrews chapter 5. Verses 1 through 5. Every priest is selected from among men and is appointed to, be rep to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own. This is why he has to offer the high priest, and that day had to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of others. No one takes his honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Faithful forever high priest, far surpassing any of the earthly priests of that day or of this day. For this reason, Hebrews 10, 17, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. He is our faithful, forever high priest. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he is our high priest. And now, we as believers in Christ are to be a, a holy priesthood, offering up spiritual sacrifices to God. 1 Peter chapter 2. He's a faithful forever high priest. We are to be a kingdom of priests offering up sacrifices unto God. 1 Peter chapter 2. All the way back here. Sometimes marking it makes it worse. Okay. Verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 5. Verse 4, coming to him as to living stones, rejected men, reje rejected indeed by men, but chosen of God and precious. You all are living stones. You're all being built up into a spiritual house. How exciting is that? You're all being built up into a holy priesthood, offering up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Offering up spiritual sacrifices through Jesus Christ. Acts of kind, whatever it is that we're doing in the name of Jesus, giving somebody a mic, whatever it is that we're doing in, the name, in, doing it in the name of Jesus, and explaining to them that we're doing it in the name of Jesus. We're offering up spiritual sacrifices unto God. Our works of service, our ministry, are all spiritual sacrifices. Here's a great sacri spiritual sacrifice that I know you all find difficult. Because I find it difficult and we're made of flesh and blood. I beseech you, Romans 12, 1, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and don't be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind, that you may prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So 
a spiritual sacrifice that we offer up to God is our lives, is our bodies, is our putting down the, the deeds of the flesh, and our being changed and transformed into the image and likeness of Christ. So any time that that opportunity comes um, to respond in the spirit or respond in the flesh, we'll have the opportunity to offer up spiritual sacrifices unto God, to be transformed into the image and likeness of God. Spiritual sacrifices. He's our faithful forever high priest. He has offered up sacrifices for us. We are to be a priesthood, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord. Hebrews chapter 13, 5 and 6, is another spiritual sacrifice. The things that we do, spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to him. But do not forget to do good and to share for such sacrifices God is well pleased with. Ephesians 5, 2 has another reference to a sacrifice, an offering. Therefore, be imitators of God, dear children, and walk in love. As Christ has loved us and given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So, again, they will know us by our love. Spiritual sacrifice offered up to God. Love. Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. One more. And then we're going to um, head toward the closing. Indeed, I have all I need, and I, I have all in abound. I am full, Paul says, having received from Aphrodite the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So in our giving, in our gifts, our sacrifices that we offer unto God, and you describe there as a sweet-smelling sacrifice. And so here's a quick little sidebar. So he said there, I'm, all, I'm okay, I'm well taken care of, I'm content. And you know that verse in the Bible that preceded that, where Paul said, I've learned to be content, I've learned the secret of contentment, Contentment is found only in Jesus Christ. The contentment of the things of this world are all passing, right? Our pursuit. I know he won't watch this, so I'm going to say this. So I was talking to my sister by, via text, and um, she was telling me how much my dad is struggling with the fact that his wife died, and that he's alone in the house there, and 57 plus years of marriage, 57 years of marriage, or whatever years they had before that of, you know, going to high school together. And he actually said, I have to talk to him about this, but he actually said to my sister, what do you think he said? He says, I know he's lonely, he's told me how lonely he is, but he actually said, I got nothing to live for. That's actually what he said. And see, unless you're living for the Lord Jesus Christ, you could go after your kids. You could go after your spouse. You could go after whatever you want to go after. Unless you're living for Jesus Christ, all that other stuff will pale in comparison. Eventually, it gets taken away. I understand. Some, 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 some others, some of us in the room have dealt with death and death of a husband or death of a child. I, I understand the pain of that. But the sadness to hear someone say, "I got nothing to live for." now that this has been taken from my life is um, kind of sad and kind of tragic because at the end of the day, it'll just be us standing before God and that will be the end of it, right? Our contentment needs to come from the Lord. He said here, John read in Hebrews chapter 13, make sure that your character is free from a love of money. Be content with what you have. For he himself has said, and here's where the contentment has to come in the life of the believer. Only place it can come from. He says, be content with what you have. And then it says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Our contentment has to come from the Lord for us to truly have that lasting contentment. And the uncontentment that people have in the world, the discontentment that people have in the world, they go after and fill it with drugs, Alcohol, you know this, sexual immorality, 
pornography on the internet, a whole bunch of hosts of whatever it is, relationships with them. All that stuff because there's such that emptiness that they have in their heart and in their soul. And apart from Jesus Christ, that void will never be full, filled, right? Be content with what you had. And the contentment has got to be in this. I will never leave you or forsake you. Jesus said, and in the original where he said that, is I will never, 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 never. It's like five, one time in English, five times in the Greek. I will never, 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 five, leave you or forsake you. I am with you always, even to the end of the stage. I came to be your Jesus, Emmanuel. I came to be your Savior. That's why people are so up and down. We, even as believers, should be so up and down, you know. Our circumstances are going good, we're happy. Our circumstances are going bad, we're not so happy. You know, and our happiness and our joy, and our, but our joy and contentment have to come from the Lord. Otherwise, you just go from one fix to another. Right? And that's what happens to people. They'll just go from one fix to another because uh, their contentment is not in Christ. And it has to be in Christ. He created you. He created for you for His glory. He created you to have a relationship with you. He created you to save you from the wrath to come and have eternal life in Him. And that's where our contentment has to come. So, Jesus Christ is immutable. He is unchanging. The foundational question would be, what is the hope that I have today in knowing that Jesus is immutable and unchanging? You know, when the rubber hits the road and uh, we walk out of here and we go and do wherever we go, we're do, what difference does it make when life comes at us and that Jesus Christ is immutable and unchanging. He has to be enough. No matter what lies ahead, we can be confident and sure that Jesus Christ will be unchanged. Greater is he who lives in us than he that lives in the world. This ought to give us a great hope in the midst of changing and difficult times. Because our Christian life, we're, we're, we're getting ready to close here, our Christian life is based on the certainty and the steadfastness of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 11, a couple of verses there, final exhortation and encouragement and exhortation. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. So there's that faith that it gives us to have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For He comes to God must believe that He exists. The person who is saved, the person who is going to be saved, the person who will be saved, the person who is being saved, they come to God and they believe that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. That He's the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. That's what draws them. And that's what keeps them. And that's what draws us as believers in Christ. Just the joy of His presence. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Just a couple other verses here. It's right over here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Jesus Christ is sin yesterday, today, and forever. He is our mediator. He is our intercessor. He is our high priest. Our joy, our hope, our contentment, our purpose in life are defined by Him. Let me just say it this way. Sometimes people think, if I just get this thing right over here, I just get this right over here. My life's a mess. I just get this right over here. Then I'm going to be okay. But if this thing over here that, you're trying, that we're trying to get right, I mean, there's some things that we need to get right, I understand, but if this thing over here is just something over here, and then I'm going to be okay, forget it. Because then there's going to be something else. It's like that game. What's that game? Wow, that they keep popping up. Unless that thing that we got to get right, so to speak, is our pursuit of the Lord and our relationship with Him and our growing in Christ likeness and our growing in holiness and our repentance and faith in Him. That's the pursuit. That's the life of the child of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what we've been given. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, and is reserved in heaven for you, who are being kept by the power of God through faith 
for salvation better, better to be re, for salvation to be revealed at the last time. So, do you have that living hope? Do you have a living hope for the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Have you been born again to a living hope through Jesus Christ? That's the encouragement. That's the invitation. That's the exhortation that we make certain that we keep offering each and every Sunday as we're preaching the word. Do you have that living hope in you? Has the Lord saved you? Will you turn to him in repentance and faith today, today, to be saved? And actually, in a minute I'm going to ask Brother John just to come up here and just up, just come up here and stand. Actually, Brother John, just come up now, please. I'm just going to ask Brother John to come up and just stand right here in a minute, and I'm going to pray. And if the Lord is touching someone's heart, uh, that he is calling somebody to be saved, he's calling someone to the living hope in the resurrection of God through Jesus Christ, they recognize their sin, they recognize the carnage, they recognize the, 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 the sin in their life, and they want to turn to Jesus Christ to be saved from the wrath of God that's hanging over their head as a death sentence over them. And they want to turn to Christ today to be saved. When I pray here in a minute, just come walk, slip up out of the pew, just come stand over here and talk to Brother John, and he'll talk with you and pray with you um, about that, okay? And then for us as believers in Christ, actually, I'm not, this isn't stage, I didn't think of this. Just now, I'll stand on this side. And for the believer in Christ, the one who's already been saved, the one who's already born again, there's some trial or tribulation or difficulty or struggle, and it's like, and you just want prayer for something that's going on in your life and, and in your struggle with the Lord, and, but in the confidence that knows that you know that Jesus Christ is immutable and unchanging. I'll pray with you in a moment after I pray. So you got that, right? Quote for the week. Arthur Pink wrote a book about the attributes of God. He said, God cannot change for the better. He's already perfect. And being perfect, he cannot change for the worse altogether unaffected by anything outside of himself. Improvement or deterioration is impossible. He is perpetually the same. And the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we praise him for it. So Lord Jesus, we do. We thank you and praise you this morning for the immutability, for the unchangeableness of, of the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of a world that is swirling out of control, you are unchanging. And Lord, so there's two groups of people here this morning. Probably, actually, there's three. <laughs> One is those who need to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To have that living hope. To know that their sins are forgiven, that they're turning away from their sin and from the wrath of God that's on them. And they recognize that. And they want to turn to Christ and, 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 and to be saved. And to be encouraged in that truth. If a person is feeling God speaking to their heart, I ask them to come up here and stand with Brother John and Brother John will pray for you. The second group of people, I said there's three. The second group, there's actually three. Let's go to the middle group. Pretenders. Professors of faith in Jesus Christ, but unsaved. By and large, their life gives no evidence of the fact that they are a child of God. The Bible says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, unto the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father. That's the group that are going to hear, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, I never knew you. Lord, if you're touching someone's heart this morning, and they recognize that they're in that situation and state, Lord, and they want their pastor to pray with them, I'd be happy to pray with them and encourage them in their faith. Or if somebody's called to baptism, or if somebody's called to church membership, or if someone's called just to, for prayer as a believer about an area of their life and a struggle that they have, and they just need to stand on the immutability and the unchangeableness of Jesus Christ, I'd be happy to pray with that person. If anybody feels led to come forward, there's no music. Maybe Joan, just go over there. Joan, please, just go play a little piano. And again, I'm not staging this. I'm not orchestrating this. I just, I don't do these wasn't contrived. I'm just giving us, everyone here, that opportunity. Um, and for the unsaved person and the person that the Lord is wooing to themselves, the Bible says today is the day of salvation.
turn to Christ today to be saved. So Joan's just going to play a little bit for a minute there in the background. And, we'll just, and, and everybody just join your hearts in prayer. And if the Lord is leading someone to um, ask for prayer, come forward, you do so. Thank you, Jesus.